Welcome to Nanobyte. Today we will learn about file systems, what they are, what they are good for, how they work, we will learn the inner workings of FAT, and we will make our bootloader load the kernel from disk. So what is a file system, and why would you ever need something like that? Let's imagine going to a big library, and we want to read The Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien. We go to the nice lady at the front desk and ask her about the book. The lady will look it up in a catalog and she will tell us to go to the second floor where the fantasy fiction section is and look into the shelf 4A. We walk up to the stairs and find dozens of shelves full of books. We go to the 4A shelf and notice that the books are ordered alphabetically by the author's name. And then we finally find the book we are looking for. A file system is just like the library, a system of organizing pieces of data on some form of storage. If all the books in the library were put on random shelves, finding anything would be impossible. The same holds true for data on a disk. If you didn't have a file system to help you organize all this data, you wouldn't be able to find anything. The term file system is typically used in the context of organizing data in nested structures of files and folders, but there can be other ways of organizing data on a disk. For example, relational database systems organize data in entities, attributes and relationships between these attributes. There's a huge number of file systems that exist out there, and they differ in how they work, what features they offer, and their limits. Some of the most commonly used file systems are NTFS is the standard file system used on Windows machines. It is quite an advanced file system. It has many features including permission controls, journaling, encryption, compression, and many others. The FAT family of file systems. These are older file systems that were the default for the 9x versions of Windows, Windows 95, 98, and Millennium. They are some of the simplest file systems that are still used in modern applications, and writing drivers for them is very simple. FAT32 and XFAT are almost always used for external storage devices like SD cards and USB flash drives, where portability between operating systems is important. Also, they are preferred in embedded applications where computing power is severely limited. APFS is used by Apple in macOS. It is also a very advanced file system and has many features and it was pretty recently introduced to improve the older HFS Plus. HFS Plus is the older file system that's used on Mac OS X. The Ext family of file systems are used on Linux systems. Because it's one of the simplest file systems and it is supported even by toasters, I decided to use FAT. In particular, FAT12, as it is the flavor used on floppy disks. Moving to FAT16 or FAT32 is not very difficult. They work basically the same, except for some data structures which have been changed. So let's dive straight into it and see how it works. A typical FAT disk is organized into four regions. The reserved sectors region begins with the boot sector, with which we are already pretty familiar. It contains some really important parameters, like the size of a sector, the size and location of each other region, as well as some other metadata about the disk, like the volume ID and serial number. Our bootloader is also stored in this region. FAT32 uses an additional sector for storing these headers, called the File System Information Sector, but this is not present in FAT12 and FAT16. There can be other things stored in this region depending on the file system implementation that created it. For example, older versions of Windows added additional sectors to store its bootloader. Next we have the file allocation table region, which contains two copies of the file allocation table. This is a simple lookup table which will give us the location of the next block of data. We will get back to this in a minute. Third, we have the root directory region, which contains the root directory. This is basically the table of contents of the disk. It contains entries for each file or folder located in the root of the disk. This table contains things like the file name, the location of the file on the disk, the size, the attributes, and some other metadata. 
And the final region is the data region, which contains the actual contents of the files as well as all the other directories. To understand how files are read, let's go through an actual example. I created a disk image and we will go step by step to read a file in the directory which is named test.txt. First we need to figure out where the root directory region begins. This region contains the table of contents where our file should be. We know that the root directory is the third region, the first two being the reserved region and the fat region. So if we can calculate the sizes of both of these regions, we will know where the root directory begins. The boot sector contains a field called reserved sectors. This gives us exactly the size of the reserved region measured in sectors. In our case, this is just one sector. To get the fat region size, what we have to do is multiply the file allocation table count and the number of sectors per fat. In our case, we have two file allocation tables, each being 9 sectors long, so the total size of this region is 18. If we add these up, we have the sector at which the root directory begins, that is 1 plus 18 equals 19. We should also calculate the size of the root directory so we know how many sectors to read and when to stop searching. For that we have the directory entry count field. Looking at the specification we know that a directory entry is 32 bytes. So the root directory is 224 multiplied by 32 which is 7168 bytes. If we divide this number by the number of bytes per sector, we will get 14, which is the number of sectors that we need to read. If we had an additional entry, we would have gotten 7200 bytes, or 14.06 sectors. In this case, we need to round up to the next integer number, so we need to read 15 sectors. A trick we can use to achieve that result is to add the number of bytes per sector minus 1 to the total byte count before performing the division. Now that we know where the root directory is, we need to read it from disk into memory. Next, let's go through this, these directory entries and figure out where our file is. This is what the directory entry looks like. The most important fields for us are the file name and the first cluster number. You can see here that the file name is only 11 characters long. This is how things worked in the MS-DOS and Windows 3.1 era. You couldn't have file names any longer than that. Long file names first appeared in Windows 95 and these were done in a hackish way by having a special value in the attribute field and then using all the other fields to store parts of the long file name. We won't be discussing these in this episode since the 11 characters are enough for us to load the kernel, but we will in a future episode about FAT. So this part is pretty straightforward. We compare the file name that we have with the file name field and if it matches that means we have found the directory entry. In our case the third entry matches the test.txt file. From this entry we only need the first cluster number which in our case is 3. You may have noticed that we have two first cluster fields, a high and a low field. These are used together to get a 32-bit cluster number in FAT32 but in our case, since we are working with FAT12, we only need the low 16 bits. So what are these clusters exactly? Just like disks use blocks called sectors, FAT uses blocks called clusters. And the sectors per cluster field in the root sector gives us the size of a cluster. Since we already know where the first cluster of the file is located, we can already read the first block of the file into memory. The cluster number gives us the location in the data region and it starts from 2. So to convert it to a sector number, we first take the total size of all the first three regions and then add the cluster number minus 2 multiplied by the number of sectors per cluster. In our case, we already know the sizes of the first three regions, which are 1, 18 and 14. Then we subtract 2 from the cluster number, 3, and multiply by the number of sectors per cluster, which is 2. Adding it all together gives us 35, which is the sector number where the data begins. So now we simply need to read a cluster starting at sector 35, which will give us the first block of the file contents. After doing that, we need to figure out what the next cluster is. This is where the file allocation table comes into play. 
This is a simple lookup table where the index of an entry corresponds to a cluster number and the entries indicate the next cluster. The size of each entry depends on the FAT type. For FAT12, each entry is 12 bits wide, that is 1 byte and a half. Similarly, for FAT16, each entry is 16 bits wide and for FAT32, each entry is 32 bits wide. In our example, the first cluster was 3, which would correspond to the fourth entry in the table. The fourth entry contains the value 4, so this is our next cluster. Same as before, we calculate the sector number for cluster 4, read the data and then move on to the next cluster. This procedure will repeat until the cluster number has a value above FF0 hexadecimal. These are special values which mark the end of a chain. Once we've reached the end of the chain, we've also reached the end of the file. Now, what if the file we want to find is not in the root directory but in a folder? In that case, we need to split the path into its components and then start with the first component. We follow the same steps as before. The folders and files are read in the same way, but the contents of a folder have the same structure as the root directory. Once we finish reading the directory, we search for the next component in the path and we keep doing that until we reach the file. Better understand what we need to do, let's try to implement this algorithm in C. We will rewrite it later in assembly as it will be much easier once we understand all the steps. Continuing from where we left off in part 2, I will start by creating a tools folder and another fat folder inside. I will also create a fat.c file which will contain our implementation. For now we don't need to integrate this code into our operating system, so I will write it as a standalone program. This is a good practice when working on your operating system, whenever possible to write and test your code on an existing platform like Windows or Linux, where you have all the debugging tools available, and then integrate it into the operating system. We can start by writing the main function, where our program will take two command line arguments, the fat disk image and then the file name of the file that we want to read. Here we check if the user introduced the correct number of parameters and print the syntax otherwise. Before going any further, let's integrate this into our makefile. The rules I added are really simple. We just call the GCC compiler like we normally would and the dash G flags add symbols for debugging. I also added an all target which will trigger all the components to be built. Now back to the program, the next thing we need to do is read the boot sector and put that in a data structure. I created a structure called boot sector and then simply copied all the headers from the bootloader. We don't care about the bootloader code so I simply ignore that part because it doesn't contain any useful information. Next I created a function called readBootSector, which reads the boot sector from the disk and stores its data in a global variable. To keep things simple, I am simply returning a boolean value indicating the success. And of course, C doesn't have boolean types, so I added a typedef for that and some defines for the true and false constants. To implement this method, we simply need to call fread and give it a pointer to the boot sector global variable to store the data. Something we need to keep in mind is that modern compilers may add padding bytes to data structures. The reason is that aligning those to 4 or 8 bytes will improve the performance of certain operations. In our case, this would be a bad thing because the boot sector structure wouldn't match to what's actually on the disk, so we need to tell the compiler not to do that. This is done in GCC by adding underscore underscore attribute underscore underscore and then double parentheses and packed. Next I call this function from main and handled any potential errors. 
Next, I implemented another function, read sectors. I wanted this function to be similar to the disk routine we wrote in assembly in part 2. So when we have to translate this code into assembly, it will be much easier. So this function takes as parameters the file handle, the sector number or the LBA, the number of sectors to read and the pointer to where to store the data. To perform the actual read, we first seek to the right position in the file, which would be the sector number multiplied by the sector size that we read from the boot sector. And then we read the number of sectors from that location. Using this function, I implemented another function, readFAT, which will read the file allocation table into memory. As we discussed earlier, the FAT region begins right after the reserved region, and the reserved region's size can be found in the reserved sectors field from the boot sector. After allocating enough memory, we just need to call the readSectors function to read the file allocation table. After that, I called readFAT from the main function and handled any errors. We also need to read the root directory into memory. So let's first create a directory entry structure which contains all the fields from the FAT specification. Let's also add a global variable which will contain the root directory and is an array of directory entries. In the read root directory function, we start by calculating the beginning position. This is the sum of the sizes of the previous two regions, the reserve sectors plus the file allocation tables. Next, we need to determine how many sectors to read, which would be the total size of the root directory in bytes divided by the size of a sector. Also, let's not forget to round up. After that, we can allocate the memory for the root directory. Notice that I allocated using the sector count instead of the size. This is because the read sectors function can only read full sectors. So we need to make sure we allocate enough memory not to overflow. Finally, we read the sectors and add this to the main function as well. The next step would be to find the file in the root directory. This is what the find file function that I initially called read file and then change my mind will do. And it will return a pointer to the corresponding directory entry. The implementation is pretty straightforward. We just iterate over all the entries and compare the name parameter using the memCompare function. Finally, we can add this to the main function as well. At this point, I wanted to test the code I have written so far. So I created a test.txt file that I then added to the disk image by modifying the make file. Looks like I got some errors that I forgot to include some headers. This is an easy fix. When running the program, we need to provide the test.txt file name in the format used by FAT, which is 11 characters all caps and padded with spaces. And it looks like it found the file since we didn't get any error messages. If I run it with the bad file name, it will tell me that it couldn't find the file. Next, I implemented the read file method. We will pass the file as a directory entry that we got from the find file function. I made the modification to the function that reads the root directory so that it saves the sector number where the root directory ends and the data region begins. This way we don't have to repeat the calculation. 
I will create a current cluster variable which will keep track of the current cluster and its initial value will be the first cluster from the directory entry. Then we begin the main loop, where we read each cluster and get the next cluster from the chain. The formula for converting from a cluster to a sector is the root directory end, which is the same as the size of all the previous regions combined, plus the current cluster minus 2, the first two clusters are reserved, multiplied by the number of sectors per cluster. Now that we know the sector to read, we read one cluster using the read sectors function and then advance the position in the output buffer. Next we need to determine what the next cluster is, which is a simple lookup in the file allocation table. What's a bit tricky is the fact that each entry in the table is 12 bits wide, so we need to calculate the index by multiplying the current cluster number by 3 and then dividing by 2. This gives us the byte index into the table and then we need to select the correct bits. If the remainder of the division by 2 is 0 or the current cluster is an even number, then we need to take the bottom 12 bits. So we apply a bit mask to remove the top bits that we don't need. If the remainder of the division is 1, or the current cluster is an odd number, we need to take the upper 12 bits, so we shift the value to the right by 4 bits. This will give us the next cluster in the chain that we put in the current cluster variable. Finally, we add the loop exit condition. We need to keep reading until the current cluster is greater or equal to FF8, which marks the end of the chain. Now that the read file method is done, we can call it from main. When allocating the memory, make sure to allocate at least an extra sector, so we don't overwrite anything or get a segmentation fault. After checking for errors, I will print the contents of the file. To do this, I loop over each character, if it's printable, I print it, otherwise I print the hex number. Let's give this a try and see what happens. Looks like I have to add an include for isPrint, ctype.h. And look at that, it works perfectly. This is awesome. We have implemented our very own FAT driver in C. This will be really handy in the future, but right now we are working on the bootloader, so we need to convert it to assembly so that it can fit inside the boot sector. Easy, right? Going back to the bootloader that we wrote in the previous episode, I wanted to first make some small improvements. I wanted to make sure that the code segment is zero, because some BIOSes might actually run our bootloader using the code segment 7C0, which could be unexpected. We can't manipulate the code segment register directly, we have to perform a far jump to achieve that. I used a trick to perform the jump by pushing the segment and offset to the stack and then performing a far return, but you can do this using the jump instruction as well. The second change I made was to read the drive parameters using the BIOS routine int13 with AH8, which should give us the number of heads and sectors. I'm not sure if this was necessary, since we already have this information stored in the formatted disk, but I thought that the disk could get corrupted, so having the BIOS tell us these things might be more reliable. Going back to reading the FAT file system, I started by calculating the root directory's location and size, and then reading it into memory. We've already done these calculations in C, and they are pretty straightforward. All we have to do is use the arithmetic instructions and shuffle around registers until we get the correct values. We already wrote the function that reads from disk into memory, we just need to set its parameters and call it. 
the sector in AX, the number of sectors to read in CL, the drive number in DL and the memory address to write to in ESBX. The next step is to search for the kernel.bin file through the directory entries. I will use bx to count how many entries we've already checked, and the di register will point to the current directory entry. Because the file name field is the first field in the structure, this means that di will also point directly to the file name field. I added the search kernel label to mark the beginning of the loop. Next, I created a string that contains the kernel.bin file name in the format expected by FAT and I stored it in the SI register and its length in the CX register, which is 11. After saving the value of DI, I call the repE CMBSB instruction. The CMPSB instruction, which is shorthand for compare string bytes, can be used to compare two bytes in memory. One stored in DSSI and the second stored in ESDI. Unlike the compare instruction, which requires at least one of the operands to be a register, this instruction can actually be used to compare two bytes in memory directly. Additionally, this instruction also increments or decrements both SI and DI depending on whether the direction flag is cleared or set respectively. The repE instruction is a shorthand for repeat while equal, and it will repeat the compare instruction as long as the values are equal up to CX times. And all of this time CX is also being decremented. As you can see, this construct makes it much easier to compare the two strings without having to write an additional loop. At the end of the rep e instruction, we will restore di to its previous value. If the strings are equal, we jump out of the main loop to the found kernel label. Otherwise, we move to the next directory entry by adding 32 to di, which is the size of a directory entry. We also increment the directory entry count we already checked, which is stored in bx, and then check if we've checked them all or not. If there are more entries to check, we jump to the beginning of the loop. Otherwise, we display an error message that we haven't found the kernel.bin after searching through the entire root directory. After finding the kernel.bin directory entry, we want to save the first cluster value. After exiting the loop, DI should still point to the directory entry structure. If you look at the fetch specification, we'll notice that the offset of the lower first cluster field is 26. So we need to grab the value from di plus 26 to get the first cluster. The next step is to read the file allocation table. This is a pretty straightforward process. We just need to set the proper parameters and call the discrete method. After reading the file allocation table, we can start reading the file and process the cluster chain. Something that we need to think about right now is to decide where to put the file into memory. Since we are in 16-bit real mode, we can't access memory above the 1 megabyte limit. This region is called the lower memory. And it's pretty well standardized, so we can look for a memory map and pick a location from there without worrying too much that we'll overwrite anything. What we are looking for is a location which will maximize the amount of memory that we can use. Looks like the area between our bootloader, which is at address 7E00, and the extended BIOS data area at 8000 hexadecimal is the largest contiguous section of memory we can find at roughly 480 kilobytes. Since we are using some memory at the end of the bootloader to store the file allocation table, we should leave some room there. So I picked the address 20,000 in hexadecimal. This should let the bootloader to use whatever it needs, and it will still leave us with about 380 kilobytes. It's not ideal, but that will probably be enough for us to do whatever we need to do until we can switch to the protected 32-bit mode and use all the memory that we want.
I added two constants for the segment and offset, so if we change our minds, we can easily change them. Note that I used the EQ directive here, which means that no memory will be allocated for the constant. It will be replaced with the value at assembly time. This is equivalent to a preprocessor defined in C. Going back to the loading process, I added the load kernel loop label to mark the beginning of the second loop. To read the data, we need to convert from the cluster number to a sector. Here, because I was lazy, I did something awful that I will need to fix in the future. I hard-coded the offset to 31. For our 1.44 MB floppy disk, this will work, but it will not work on another type of disk, so I will definitely want to fix this in the future. Once we know the sector we need to read, we can call the discrete read function and then increment the value by the bytes per sector. Here I did another mistake that I will want to fix in the future. This add will overflow if the kernel.bin file is larger than 64 kilobytes, in which case the red file will be corrupted since we will be overwriting the first part of it. To fix this issue, I will need to detect this case and increment the segment as well. Getting the location of the next clusters means calculating the index in the weird 12-bit allocation table. We do the same calculations we did in C. After all of that, we check if the cluster number we got is above or equal to FF8. And if it is, that means we have successfully read the entire file, so we can exit the loop. If not, that means that there are more clusters to read, in which case we jump back to the beginning of the loop. Now that we finally finished reading the file, we will do a far jump into the beginning of the kernel. Before doing that, we will pass the boot device in DL, just like we received it from the BIOS, and we will also set up the data registers, and then we can do the far jump. Let's see what happens if we try to build. And I have a few compile errors to fix. Now that I fixed all the compile errors, let's test our code. But first we need to make a few changes to the kernel code. First the org directive needs to be changed to 0, since our code is loaded at offset 0. I also rearranged the code a bit so it looks cleaner. We no longer need to set up the data segments since we already set them in the bootloader. And for now we will use the same stack as the bootloader. I also removed the padding and the AA55 suffix that the bootloader required. Now let's test and see what happens. And it seems to work correctly. Yay! Phew, this was a lot of work, but we finally made it. Before finishing, let me show you something interesting. I opened the bootloader in a hex editor and look what I found. There are only three padding bytes with the value 0. What this means is that we used almost all the 512 bytes that we could use for the boot sector. It's great that we managed to fit everything, but if we want to add anything else, like fixing that hard-coded calculation, we actually need to remove something or refactor the code so it uses less space. And here, let me just demonstrate. I tried to add a few bytes at the end, and now when I try to compile, I'm getting an error that times is negative. This means that my code no longer fits in the 512 bytes boot sector, so I need to shorten it. This should put in perspective just how little 512 bytes actually is. With this, we end part 3 in which we learned a lot of interesting things about FAT12. Thank you a lot for your attention, you can find links to everything we talked about in the description, as well as a link to the GitHub repository, which contains all the code. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Bye!